I am uh, Jacob Heilbrunn, the editor of the National Interest, in which our, the article that is our, on our cover today is being discussed. And it is my uh, privilege and fate to introduce the introducer, which is that Peter Baker will be uh, shepherding our discussion this afternoon. And Peter and I actually go back a long way, all the way back to Oberlin College, where Peter was a reporter. And in that capacity, he actually <laughs> wrote about some of my exploits as the head of the Republican Club at Oberlin College, which was a somewhat mixed blessing since uh, it was during the latter years of the Reagan era, and Reagan was not the most popular president on college campuses at that time. Uh, so Peter, Peter was kind enough to agree to, uh, to guide our discussion. He's also served as a reporter in Russia together with his wife, Susan Glasser. He's also a friend of mine. And I wanted to, uh, as part of my job, I wanted to, before Peter takes over, I wanted to also point out we have a number of other interesting articles in this issue, including a uh, piece on Hillary Clinton and the Clint, what he calls the Clinton Doctrine by James Goldgeier, who is a uh, former uh, <laughs> government official and the dean at American University. And we all, I also have a piece on the GOP versus the world, and we called his Hillary versus the world. We'll be doing an event on that in, in a few weeks. And I hope you'll take a look at the entire issue, which I think is quite strong, including, of course, Dimitri and Graham's piece. Peter? Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much for, for, for having me. Thank you very much to everybody for coming. Uh, I think it's going to be a great and fascinating discussion. And um, now, it's true that Jacob and I did get to know each other at Oberlin College. Now, I'm going to tell you my memory of this. And since he's already sat down, he can't rebut it. But my memory is that actually Jacob was in charge, tell me if this is wrong, in charge of something called the Moderate Caucus. Because in, at Oberlin, that was the most conservative group on campus. <laughs> well, come on, that's true. That is true, you know? And like any small faction, it split into two in a doctrinal and personal uh, uh, schism that uh, I think remains unsolved to this day. But <laughs> Jacob has survived and uh, prospered as uh, one of Washington's smartest and most uh, uh, original thinkers, and uh, uh, I think what he's done with the national interest since taking over has been fabulous, and, and he did, in fact, uh, work with my wife, who's also a, a terrific editor, and, and, and we're great friends, so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled and honored uh, to be here um, today to talk uh, and to introduce our two speakers. There, now, their piece here, certainly the cover, uh, it would be great in the search engine optimization world, right? <laughs> Countdown to war is not subtle. <laughs> but the piece is subtle, and it makes some interesting points and provocative points that I think we can, uh, we can chew through today. And I, and I, I recommend that you read it and, uh, and, and think about it and, and uh, argue about it if you feel like it. Uh, uh, but, but definitely take it under consideration, because uh, uh, what's happening right now in the world, uh, and particularly in American-Russian relations and, and, and European-Russian relations, is obviously uh, of great import and something that uh, uh, deserves thorough and 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 and, uh, uh, and, and very intelligent debate, which we uh, in the newspapers sometimes encourage and sometimes don't. So our two speakers really need no introduction from me. Uh, probably everybody in this room knows them uh, extremely well. But we of course have Dimitri Symes, uh, the president and CEO of the Center for National Interest, and our host in effect today. He's also Jacob's publisher, publisher of the National Interest, uh, of course, and, and responsible for this great magazine. Uh, everybody knows, of course, probably born in Moscow, educated at uh, Moscow State University, emigrated to the United States in 1973, uh, became, of course, uh, one of President Nixon's, uh, former President Nixon's sort of informal foreign policy advisors, and then uh, his selection to head this center uh, uh, going back quite a number of years. He's also uh, worked at uh, uh, SICE at Johns Hopkins University at uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies and in University of California at Berkeley. Uh, and he just got back from Moscow, I think, three weeks ago. So he has a very fresh, on-the-ground take on what's going on there that he'll share with us today. Graham Allison, of course, again, 
everybody knows uh, Graham Allison, and, and, and nobody needs me to tell you about him, but he's director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, uh, and the Douglas Dillon Professor of Government at the John F. Kennedy School. Of course, he was the he's considered the founding dean of the modern Kennedy School, which uh, he led from 1977 to 1989. Uh, he's been an advisor to presidents uh, and secretaries of defense going back many, many years, and he hosted me at a very interesting conference about uh, maybe about six months ago, I think, about Russia that we had up at uh, up at Harvard. We had a, a fascinating group of Russians and Americans got together to talk through some of these very same issues. So I think with that, let's go ahead and open discussion. Each, I think our, 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 talk, our speakers are going to start for about 10 minutes apiece, is that right? And then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So thanks very much. If you've had a chance to read the article, you'll have a pretty good idea what uh, we uh, had to say. And uh, since I'm not going to assume, Dimitri said, don't assume that everybody's done all of their homework. <laughs> Let me uh, try to provoke you with four questions just very briefly. So first, could, the, could Russia and the US be stumbling to war? Secondly, if you imagine a hiring McKinsey or BCG uh, that Russia, the Kremlin had hired them and said, give a, give me a competitive analysis. What could we be good at as Russia? What might they come back with? Uh, third, does Putin, or at least some members of his team, hope that the US decides to arm Ukraine? And fourth, uh, if one were to imagine through some sequence of events either stirred up by the FSB or by some local uh, Russian uh, speakers or Russian ethnics in the Baltics that uh, we discovered overnight that uh, what happened to Crimea had happened to Latvia or Estonia. Uh, then two questions under question four. A, if you imagine going to a meeting of the NAC, the NATO Alliance uh, Council, uh, how many people would vote for attacking Russians who were uh, looking like the Russians who were in Crimea, uh, who were in Estonia or Latvia? How many people would, how many of the NATO members at the NAC would vote for invoking Article 5 and going to war with the Russians, at least the ones who were occupying Estonia? That's A. And B, here in the U.S., if the question arises, do we want to fight for Estonia or Latvia? Uh, as the article says, and this is a game I play from time to time, in restaurants, if you have a noisy group at the table beside you, you're trying to quiet them down, go ask them if Russia were to do to Crimea, to Estonia, what it did to Crimea, would they be in favor of sending Americans to fight for Estonia? And you'll see they'll become quiet at the table. Uh, maybe they'll get out their iPhones and search for Estonia. Uh, so uh, let me go through the questions just very quickly, the answers. Uh, so could you, Russia and the U.S. be stumbling in a war? Or uh, another way to put it is uh, when we say that war is between U.S. and Russia is inconceivable, is this a statement about what can happen in the world? Or rather a statement about what our limited uh, minds can conceive? And I would say the latter. And I was saying to Britt uh, last night when I was thinking about coming down, I uh, uh, picked up my Churchill book, which is a place where I usually start and stop. And here, if we go back to 1914, William, uh, or uh, <coughs> Churchill was 39 years old. He was the first Lord of the Admiralty, which is the cockpit of national security for Britain in the Empire. So he's responsible. And he's in London. This is now 13 July. 
The Archduke was assassinated the 28th of June, so this is two weeks later. And Clementine, his soulmate, his wife, is in uh, Scotland, where they go every summer, telling him, let's get out of London and come to, it's time for vacation. This is summer for Brits. So he writes home to her a letter every night. And the letters are just spectacular, just spectacular. So here on the 13th of July, he writes, with various items about the parliamentary session and it would continue to the end of August. The new session will begin in December. Asquith is keen to come to see you on Monday to take you to ride on his yacht. Uh, so be nice to him. Well, you must try and make the effort. I'm sure it'll repay the exertion. There's no mention, whatever, of any storm clouds in Europe. None. None. <coughs> Indeed, what's the issue that he writes to her about? And again, you have to test of your history here. Ireland, yes. <laughs> of course, the content, here's what he writes. He says, there's a problem with, you know, there's a risk of war. Of course, the contending parties may think it, it's worth a war. And from their point of view, it may be worth a war. But that is hardly the position of 40 million people who dwell in Great Britain. And their interests must be first when all is said and done. So this is about the war between Ulster and Ireland, not about Austria or Germany or others. Go then to uh, uh, July 25th. They have another discussion. He's writing to Clementine. And he says, okay, the Irish issue is getting even worse. And I don't know how it's going to come out. But then he says, for more than an hour, the ministers talked. This is the cabinet meeting on the 25th. This is five, eight days before war. The discussion uh, reached its inconclusive end. Churchill writes, and then he says, and the cabinet was about to leave when the grave, quiet tones of Sir Edward Grey, that's the foreign minister's voice, were heard reading a document which had just been brought to him from the foreign office. It was the Austrian ultimatum to Serbia, delivered almost a month after the assassination. So again, for whenever we think things are inconceivable, I would say we should go back and read our history because we're not likely to be wiser or to have greater foresight than Churchill. Churchill actually had a need to be thinking about the problem. And I'm not criticizing Churchill in this case. I'm just reminding us how stuff happens. Okay? Point two, if uh, a, a super consultants were hired to find the competitive advantage of Russia, what might they find? And we do discuss this in the article. And this is the discussion that goes on, at least among some Russians whom I know. And the answer is, well, surely if we look at the US or Europe or China, it's not economics. So what is it that we Russians can do that other people don't do, that we do better than they do? We can fight. We can threaten to fight. So I think Putin has in mind reminding people about the power that comes out of the barrel of a gun. And certainly many Russians whom I talk to would say Europeans won't fight under any circumstance for anything. And Americans are exhausted <coughs> from fighting. So where's, where does our comparative advantage lie? Third question. Does Putin want the U.S. or does some members of the Putin uh, clique uh, uh, want the U.S. to arm Ukraine? That seems almost inconceivable to most people until you work through the logic. We work through the logic in several paragraphs there, which I wish I were smart enough to have invented, but that come from a Russian friend. So wait a minute, how would this work? So the U.S 
complies with the strong view held by many in the Senate, for example, McCain and Lindsey Graham, that we should arm uh, Ukraine so they would be able to raise the costs for the Russians whom they're fighting or the separatists. Is there any weapon we could provide that Putin couldn't match or trump? Is there something Putin's prepared to do that we're not prepared to do? Namely, put boots on the ground, either acknowledged or unacknowledged. And especially if we should be arming Ukraine, this would give him a pretty easy out from what is now a very implausible lie about there's no Russians involved in this picture. Yeah? So again, I'm not uh, subscribing to this hypothesis altogether. But I think the proposition that in this game, Russia has escalation dominance sounds right to me. And that from a Russian point of view, the idea of getting somebody to play a game in which I trump them sends a very powerful message, especially to the Europeans who would be watching. Finally, the fourth question, if we imagine, God forbid, that some set of circumstances lead to little green men or special forces and security services uh, overnight taking over the capital of Estonia or Latvia. What to do? So I would not like to be the U.S. representative to the NAC. Bert can tell us what about that to see how we're going to get a vote. To fight, even to use the basis from which the U.S. would fight. Now, I hope that's wrong, but I certainly, if I were in Moscow, I would do that calculation. And similarly, from the U.S., how many Americans would be enthusiastic about a war over Latvia or Estonia? And I try this out on students at Harvard from time to time. These are only undergraduates, and what do they know? Most of them can find Estonia or Latvia on the map, but the idea that they should have colleagues fighting there seems to them way, way, way out of their mind. So this is a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous situation. And again, if you were playing the hand for Moscow, and especially if things go right, that is in the right direction in Moscow and badly in the U.S.-Russian relationship. The idea of, well, do we have any trump cards? Especially if we're prepared to be gutsy and how could we play them and what would the consequences be, I think are troubling. Now, the article is not only pessimistic, but it is trying to be realistic about the risks. The question in none of these is to give up, in my view. That is, I would vote to fight for Estonia or Latvia, even though that might end up in Americans, it would end up in Americans killing Russians and vice versa, and put you in a chicken game that could escalate to hell. Yeah? So I don't say that lightly. I would say that's the back to the worst of the old Cold War. But that's in the case the way I would vote. Speaking after Graham is a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, it is uh, a challenge uh, because there is really not very much to add. And I think that uh, Graham have provided uh, an excellent summary of our article. Uh, it's also an opportunity because it allows me not to describe the article, uh, but uh, to make some of uh, rather personal points based on uh, my recent trip to Moscow. Uh, but first, uh, let me introduce two members of our board who are right here, Brent Scowcroft, who generally doesn't need any introduction, and Ambassador Bert, who also does not need an introduction in general. But in particular, most of you may not know that Ambassador Bert is chairman of the National Interest Advisory Council. However, 
Ambassador Bert does not have a responsibility for approving covers. So uh, if some of you think that uh, the cover was uh, too striking, I think that uh, all, uh, all criticism should go uh, to Jacob Heilbrunn and to me. Uh, to Jacob, because it is his opportunity to select the covers. And it is my uh, uh, responsibility to approve them. And uh, Jacob have selected and I have approved. Uh, and uh, one reason uh, we have done it is because obviously there is an article, there is a title of the article suggested by the authors, and we hope a kind of that people would not judge the article by the cover of the magazine. But I would go a little bit beyond that. I think that uh, uh, we wanted to make a very clear and dramatic statement which would leave little to imagination. I think that we felt that this is not the time in the US-Russian relationship when you want to be too polite about what the danger is. And to the extent uh, the cover uh, focuses on that danger, on this problem, I, I think that Jacob have done very well and I congratulate myself in approving his decision. <laughs> I also would like to say that this is an unfortunate situation when uh, you have something that in our view, in my view at least, is so obvious in terms of a challenge to the American national security and so little is being uh, discussed about the issue. And I'm looking at Charles Freeman in uh, particular, who has no responsibility whatsoever for this article, but uh, who uh, has responsibility for now being a free person to express his opinions, but did not get a certain job where if uh, he was there, hopefully we would have uh, more of a discussion inside the US government of what really is happening in the world. And I think that we do have a remarkable situation when there are a lot of smart, very well-informed people who understand what is happening in international affairs. And you talk one-on-one uh, on one to them, you almost have a sense that you are part of the administration mainstream, of uh, congressional mainstream, and then you see what they are saying publicly. And it is a totally different situation. And I think that our article uh, is, a try, uh, is a kind of uh, a scream uh, in the relative darkness uh, about uh, a potentially serious danger uh, which really uh, requires our attention. I would also like to introduce Ambassador Sergei Kislyak, uh, uh, who uh, I assume does not agree with everything in the article, uh, but uh, he can express his opinions on his own. Uh, uh, but uh, I should say that uh, Ambassador is uh, uh, a good friend of the center and I am particularly grateful to him because my impressions in Moscow probably would be uh, unachievable without the Ambassador uh, offering a helping hand uh, in encouraging some people to have uh, meetings with me. Again, uh, the Ambassador has no responsibility whatsoever for anything we say here. Let me express one opinion I feel very strongly about, and here is what Graham uh, actually have said at the end of his presentation. We obviously are not predicting that there is going to be World War III. If we thought that this was imminent and inevitable, that is not a kind of an article we would be writing. The whole idea is that we have a very serious problem, but uh, it is something that we can control. And uh, I agree with Graham that uh, uh, supporting NATO allies, maintaining NATO credibility is a vital U.S. interest and we should know what needs to be done if we would come to this very unhappy situation. I also think uh, that it would be much better if we don't have to come to this unhappy situation and that we will be a kind of cautious and serious about uh, the road we are taking. Uh, in Moscow, incidentally, uh, if you look at President Putin's statements, he is not much different from President Obama. Uh, uh, the Russian president spoke for almost four hours uh, last week uh, at a major 
uh, national press conference, his direct interaction with Russian journalists and ordinary citizens, and he said absolutely categorically, there is not going to be a new war. And uh, as I understood him, he was not just talking about direct confrontation with the United States. He was saying that there would be no war over Ukraine, no direct Russian involvement in Ukraine, period. In this sense, it sounds very much like President Obama, who says, no, we are not going to be involved in any war. There is no need to be involved in any war in Ukraine or over Ukraine. Fine. I'm sure that uh, uh, Nicholas II and the Kaiser Wilhelm would say something like that with full confidence and real conviction uh, in uh, June 1914. Leaders obviously have their political agendas, and I think that most leaders are serious people, and they normally believe in fundamentals of what they're saying. But one reason human beings are not angels, but human beasts, is that we have, as humans, great talent of persuading ourselves of things that are politically convenient to us. And leaders are not exception. If something makes sense to us politically, uh, we kind of assume that that is, that that is what is uh, almost historically inevitable. And then, of course, you look at decision-making processes. In Washington, uh, there are a lot of people who have great admiration for President Obama, but I am not aware of him ever being accused of creating a very deliberate and effective decision-making process. Uh, in Moscow, President Putin has some quite impressive foreign policy and national security advisors. But uh, my impression is that he is a sole decider. And uh, it is not my impression that there is a mechanism for a deliberate uh, national security decision-making process in Moscow. Uh, there is National Security Council. Uh, the leader, the secretary of this council is General Patrushev, who is a very experienced national security official, former director of, uh, so, uh, so, former director of FSB, uh, the KGB successor agency, the role in which he replaced uh, 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 several other current senior Russian official Sergei Ivanov, and most notably, of course, uh, President Putin himself. But if you would look at uh, the bureaucratic machinery of the Security Council, the way the Council operates, and I was able to talk not just on this trip, but more generally, both uh, to regular members of the Russian Security Council and, uh, uh, and uh, to people who are on the staff of the Security Council. It's pretty clear to me that this is not a body where people put on the table uh, different opinions, where you have a vigorous debate. Uh, whatever is being presented to President Putin in terms of his making decisions is normally done uh, rather confidentially. Uh, and uh, without many opportunities uh, for others in the government who may disagree with this point of view uh, to challenge the president. And uh, uh, Putin in Russia is not just uh, the president. Uh, people uh, uh, publicly very rarely uh, refer to him as President Putin anymore. In a way it would be uh, almost demeaning. He is Putin. Uh, he is uh, clearly a cult figure a person who is much bigger than his official position uh, and uh, there is no question that even more than uh, in the United States everybody in Russia, in the Russian government serves at the pleasure of the president. Uh, the difference is that in the United States there is a role for former officials, there is a life after resignation, there is not much of that uh, in Russia. And uh, accordingly, there is even less uh, inclination uh, than in Washington to tell unpleasant things uh, to uh, the number one. So you have to understand that uh, both President Obama, even more so President Putin, uh, may genuinely believe that we are not on a dangerous track because we are reasonable. 
because we have many other priorities, because there is absolutely nothing uh, in the confrontation of Eastern Ukraine for the United States, and uh, probably even for Russia, that would be worth risking a global war. The trouble is that as the leaders say how they don't want military confrontation with full conviction, what in fact they are seeking is a victory without war. Uh, both sides have their own agendas, and both sides show a little inclination to uh, compromise on what they can consider fundamental and what they believe their countries should be entitled to. And Graham and I discuss in the piece how uh, US and Russian perceptions of what is the narrative on Ukraine, what is involved in the conflict, they are very uh, different indeed. Now, in my conversations in Moscow, uh, I uh, got a strong impression that President Putin and the number of his uh, key advisors, particularly Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, particularly people uh, in the economic bloc uh, of the government, including uh, uh, first Vice Prime Minister Shivalov, that these are all people who not only don't want confrontation with the United States, but who don't understand that putting Russia on a war footing, that having a prolonged conflict with the United States, that uh, it may be uh, detrimental not only to Russian international interests, but also to Russian domestic stability, which is a kind of a priority number one for uh, the Russian government. Putin's uh, approval ratings are sky high. Uh, they uh, are somewhere between 86 uh, and 87 percent, which is next to unbelievable. I am convinced that these ratings are genuine uh, after numerous conversations I had in Moscow. Uh, I have seen these ratings being openly questioned on Russian TV. It is not like it is not a subject of debate. I have listened to uh, leading pollsters who are in opposition to the government and who were allowed to appear on Russian TV and to express their skepticism. But about everybody said that this is a genuine figure. But then what people say that that reflects not necessarily just uh, Putin's personal popularity, but also to other things. First, the Russians are a kind of, I shouldn't say monarchists at heart, but the Russians like a concept of one supreme leader. And uh, when you have such a leader, uh, unless things go very badly, they're inclined to support that leader. In this case, obviously, President Putin. And the second thing is, there is a sense of inevitability. There is no, uh, nobody else on the Russian political scene who would look to most uh, Russians uh, as a possible alternative to Putin. Certainly not Prime Minister Medvedev. Certainly not leaders of uh, political parties in the parliament who, are, uh, how to put it, uh, are not terribly impressive, with one notable exception of Mr. Zhirinovsky, for whom I have a real admiration uh, as a clown. <laughs> uh, uh, in the opposition, uh, so-called non-systemic opposition, people outside the, the parliament, I also have to say, there is no one today uh, who has not just a statue, it would be difficult for them uh, to develop a statue with a limited access to the media and no, no presence in the parliament. But you know, when I, I listen to these people, their program, uh, I, I really have to say that I am not surprised that they have a very limited traction uh, inside Russia. So when people look at Putin, there is Putin, uh, and there is almost nobody else. The problem is that that is as long as Putin uh, basically continues to deliver to ordinary Russians on their fundamental aspirations. And uh, I was just in Moscow, so I had a limited personal experience, but the stores are full. The restaurants are full, particularly restaurants which are a kind of uh, well-known and have an established audience. 
the sanctions. It's an interesting uh, uh, reflection on the sanctions if you look at what they are doing uh, to the Russian public. First, the sanctions were supposed to punish the Putin elite. They have just uh, published in Moscow last week uh, income declarations of uh, Russian officials and uh, members of the Russian parliament. This was supposed to be a very hard year for the Russian elite, right? Overall, these people have earned 6% more than last year before sanctions were introduced. A number of officials indeed had a clear reduction in their incomes. In most cases, however, uh, a reduction in the personal compensation packages uh, was more than balanced by a dramatic increase in incomes of their spouses. Overall, the Russian elite have done very well last year. No sign of any real punishment. I'm sure people are nervous what may happen to the villas outside Russia, to the accounts, to, to whatever uh, they like to travel in their restrictions. But I can assure you that this is not a group of people uh, which feels uh, any real reason for discontent. Then you look uh, at uh, ordinary Russians. People uh, who overwhelmingly depend upon uh, their pensions, upon uh, uh, the uh, salaries which are easily directly provided by the government or provided by uh, government-owned companies. There was a minor increase in this people's standard of living, but quite minor so far. Upper middle class, these people really were squeezed. These are people who like to travel. These are people who have uh, not quite luxurious, but certainly much more uh, illustrious lifestyles than the majority of Russians. They are much more dependent upon the opportunity to travel for their children to go and to study abroad. These people, a lot of these people, are quite unhappy with Putin. But these people were already unhappy with Putin. Putin clearly was not the hero. And during the last two years, I think it is obvious that Putin increasingly stopped viewing these people as his constituency. Not that he intentionally wanted to alienate them, but uh, it was not, if you wish, his major reference group. The ordinary people are still with Putin. I do not know at what point of economic deprivation this would begin to change. But at a certain point, it might begin to change. Uh, and if that happens, of course, all these opinion polls, they may uh, go down the drain very, very quickly. And I think that political advisors, Putin's political advisors, key members of the cabinet, that they do understand it. And that is why I think they don't want to rock the board. That is why they uh, 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 pretend that Russia is no way militarily involved in Ukraine. I have not seen convincing evidence that there are Russian forces in Ukraine. Uh, but I have to say that uh, anyone who is watching Russian TV would know that you have leading uh, Russian politicians from the uh, pro-Putin uh, party in the parliament. Uh, they are coming on these TV shows and they are saying uh, how Russia would continue supporting the Russian brothers, Pyotr Tolstoy, a leading Russian uh, Channel One uh, talk show host, uh, when I pointed out on uh, uh, his show uh, that the, uh, there was uncertainty in the United States how far uh, Putin uh, may be prepared to go to support uh, the separatists, uh, uh, and uh, the host said, Dmitry, Russkies своих не бросают. The Russians never abandoned their own. And there was a real ovation uh, in response to this statement. So it's pretty, it's pretty clear that Putin, at this point, not only for foreign policy reasons, but for domestic reasons, does not want to create an impression that Russia is really a party to the conflict in Ukraine. 
But what would happen if as a result of combination of sanctions, Russian own economic uh, mismanagement, uh, decline in price of oil, combination of, of, of all these uh, developments, what happens if uh, Russia would be really squeezed much more seriously than it is today. And on this, there are two different responses among Putin's advisors. One uh, is that, uh, well, we should not close any doors, that only hotheads would want to have a, a lasting confrontation with the West, that Russia is still very much a part of Europe, and it is not in the Russian interest to make any drastic moves uh, which would force Russia to become isolated from the uh, Euro-Atlantic civilization. And uh, the other people uh, uh, who basically belong to the school, uh, who are saying, well, the United States is a kind of hopeless, not much is going to happen in the US-Russian relationship uh, that would help Moscow. However, if Russia wants a kind of to reach an agreement with the European Union, with more reasonable powers in the European Union, and they're talking about Germany, France, uh, some countries in Eastern Europe, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, that you still have to appear, that you have to still appear at your best behavior. Because if you would uh, uh, absolutely refuse to cooperate with the United States, not only you would lose some valuable economic opportunities, but you would also scare the French, the Germans. You would deprive yourself of a chance in a way to split a little bit uh, the European Union from the United States. So for all these reasons, these people are saying that even if there are more serious uh, economic problems in Russia, Russia should not close the door on the West. That is one school of thought. Another school of thought, and these people call themselves the realists. Others in the Russian government call, call them hotheads. These people have a very uh, uh, different view. They think, let's not tease ourselves. This is not about Ukraine. These problems uh, were growing, mushrooming over a long period of time. Uh, uh, Obama refused to go uh, to the Olympics because of disagreement with Russia on a variety of issues, particularly on Snowden. And they're saying, well, can you imagine that uh, there would be uh, a Russian defector coming uh, to the United States uh, with similar credentials in Snowden, and that anyone would expect that the United States uh, would uh, uh, return him uh, to Russia? Uh, they're talking about uh, the fundamental disagreements with the United States and the West in general on Libya, Syria, going back uh, to uh, the 90s, Yugoslavia. And basically, I think that Putin, who I think is between these two camps, he kind of summarized this point of view very well uh, in his recent TV interview, uh, where he said, they in the West really like Russia when we need humanitarian assistance. And then they would send us some potatoes. But the, uh, the moment we start expressing uh, our opinions, the moment we would make clear that we disagree with anything they're doing, at that moment uh, they would not accept that we're entitled to our point of view, and they would introduce all kinds of punishments. And according uh, to this view, as Graham have indicated, Russia cannot compete with the West economically. Sanctions are not going to be removed, uh, whatever Russia does, in the framework of what the Russians would consider acceptable in terms of their interests and their dignity. And accordingly, the only way uh, Russia can get attention is to demonstrate that it is prepared to fight. Uh, they find offensive uh, an argument that they are really fighting already a war in Ukraine. What kind of war uh, representatives of this school are saying? When, uh, when was the last time Russian Air Force has bombed Kyiv? Uh, is uh, 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 the Russian uh, tank army approaching Odessa? Uh, or for that matter, borders of Poland? Uh, Russia, uh, in their view, 
uh, is uh, doing fairly little in Ukraine except basically protecting uh, those two limited areas next to the Russian border. Uh, and perhaps the only way for Russia to be taken seriously, according to this point of view, is to demonstrate that Russia is prepared to do more, much more. And uh, if Russian uh, economic situation really goes downhill, that would be an argument for these people, not for a greater moderation, as the Obama administration would hope, but on the contrary, for a much more robust response on Moscow's part. Now, they don't want war. They certainly do not think uh, that uh, it is advisable for Russia to attack uh, Latvia or Estonia. Uh, what they do think uh, that uh, they have an escalation dominance in the region. What they do think that uh, Obama uh, is bluffing uh, when he's saying how he would uh, protect Baltic countries no matter what. They assume that Obama uh, uh, believes that he would never face this choice. And I think that uh, they would be prepared, uh, like um, major powers before uh, uh, World War I, on one hand to assume the worst about intentions of their opponents, but also a kind of think that their opponents are rational and would know when to stop. And uh, you find a lot of this thinking uh, in Moscow. Uh, we were, my wife and I, at a dinner with uh, an important Russian official. And I have to say that my wife increasingly uh, was losing her appetite as the conversation was uh, uh, moving increasingly in the direction of what the Russian military uh, would do. Uh, if it uh, uh, would, uh, if it would really come to that, and uh, then we came back to Washington, and uh, we uh, got a song uh, from uh, this uh, very charming, and I mean it literally, and smart woman who is also an accomplished singer and an accomplished songwriter, and the song was uh, about uh, Russian mother sending her son to war, they have a son, sending her son to war, and knowing that he probably would not come back, but feeling an enormous sense of pride that her family, once again, would be prepared to stand for Russia and to do what the Russian people expect, privileged families, really do, in a moment of trial. And she felt like she was a mother of a, a Russian officer, sending her son to Borodino. And here I will stop. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you very much for those two presentations. Really appreciate that. I think uh, uh, we're going to open up for questions. I'd like to take the moderator's prerogative and, and start off with one. But um, what we should try to do is, I think, to have some cons quick, concise answers so we can get in as many questions as possible. I'd like to start off, though. You, President, uh, sorry, Prime, Prime Minister uh, Medvedev today said that the Russian economy has lost $26.8 billion dollars because of low oil prices and sanctions, and that the economy has shrunk by 2% in the first quarter of the year. Uh, he says this is the price we have to pay for our position, and that uh, no matter the cost, we had no other way. So I guess the question is, you've laid out a pretty uh, stark scenario in which through stumbles like before World War I, Graham mentioned in the article you talk about Pearl Harbor, um, if, if, if if there's a stark scenario in which we could stumble into war, then what is the right approach that the West uh, at this point should take uh, in responding to Russia uh, that would be short of uh, ceding, in effect, what they won't cede? Yeah. Uh, this, uh, again, to be quick, I've seen any, I, th I think uh, that the current policy is to punish Russia for unacceptable behavior, but uh, a strategy has to have an objective as well as a, as a means. And so to what objective? 
And if I hear sometimes a discussion, the objective is that Putin will say that he was sorry and go back home or something. And it seems to me that's not in this world. So I would think we should be inventing or working hard to find and invent exit ramps that would allow Putin to save as much face as possible, that would end up with, uh, I think the terms of a deal are about as clear as the terms of an Israeli-Palestinian deal. They're just to be done. So it's a Ukraine that's not part of NATO for as far for as one can see. It's a Ukraine with a degree of decentralization that allows people in Donetsk and Luhansk uh, to elect their governor and to speak Russian if they want to, and a reasonable level of decentralization in that regard. Uh, allow a Ukraine that can trade economically both with the EU and Russia, but not in a discriminatory manner, discriminatory form, that puts Crimea to the side for the foreseeable future, uh, and that it offers some relief from sanctions and Russia rejoining the community. And I think that, as, the, as Dimitri said, is that, is that uh, looked like it was doable with Minsk 1 and then with Minsk 2. It's hard to get all the pieces exactly together and get them to work, but uh, uh, that would be good enough for me. And I would seem to me, if if it were, maybe if the relationship with between Putin and Obama were different, they could do that deal. But that's hard to see that working and with the chemistry that they have. So Mrs. Merkel and the Germans have you know, stepped into the breach. I think they've done a little, bit, you know, done done what they could. So that's the place where I would try to go to try to get an exit ramp, where basically we would have a lousy outcome. And Crimea would be Crimea. Uh, we would have given up, quote, some things that we wouldn't want to give up in, in general. But Russia wouldn't be veering off to, you know, uh, its own uh, its own space. And we, and at the same time, making very clear that NATO member countries are a bright, bright, bright red line. And I would have tripwire troops there all the time. So I think the rotation of our troops, so that if they come to. Uh, the capital of Estonia or Latvia, they'll have to kill some Americans the first day, uh, is the best way to, I mean, it's a very risky policy, but it's the best way to make clear that you can't go there. Yeah. As I was talking to people in Moscow and trying to understand their positions, uh, the person who uh, I uh, came to feel was most committed to uh, keeping uh, Donetsk and Lugansk as a part of Ukraine was Vladimir Putin and his close advisors. That is not Putin is uh, a peacenik, not because he is an altruist, not necessarily because he is a great believer in uh, Ukrainian territorial integrity. It's uh, practical. Uh, it is because uh, first and foremost he, uh, as I was told, understands uh, that uh, without uh, Donetsk and Lugansk and, of course, Crimea, Ukraine, demographically, would be an inherently hostile country. Uh, if you would look at the demographics of Ukraine, without these regions, with a strong Russian population, you would have to assume that Ukraine would be a country totally hostile to Russia. And that's not uh, what I was told uh, Putin wants. The second uh, thing is uh, that uh, Russia uh, needs to assure that Ukraine would not go into NATO. Uh, the best way for Russia to assure that is to give enough autonomy to these eastern regions that they would have uh, a veto power or at least a lasting break on Ukrainian membership in NATO. And then there is a sad thing. Uh, these uh, uh, two uh, regions, Lugansk and Donetsk, are terribly devastated. And for Russia to accept a full economic responsibility for their recovery, while Russia would be under sanctions, when they would get no foreign investment, they would be quite challenging to the Russian economy. And you know, uh, we were talking about Russian political stability which is a priority number one uh, for Putin. It would be in the long run detrimental to Russian political stability. People are willing uh, to uh, pay for the Russian glory, for the Russian imperial glory, 
but only up to a point. That suggests to me that we have an opportunity if we really are interested in still protecting Ukrainian territorial integrity, uh, again, unfortunately or fortunately, without uh, uh, Crimea. Uh, but these regions would be a part of Ukraine. These regions would have to accept full authority of the federal government uh, on uh, uh, fiscal matters, on foreign policy, on national security. Uh, we need to understand that the Ukrainian government will not be happy with this arrangement. Uh, because the Russians are not talking about a proforma autonomy. They're talking about an autonomy uh, uh, which would not require them to pay for these regions anymore and which would give uh, these regions a role uh, in formulating re uh, Ukrainian strategy toward NATO. And the second thing you would have to expect, if you are Ukrainian, that other regions with strong Russian populations uh, that if they see uh, that this autonomy was uh, uh, granted to Donetsk and Lugansk, you may expect questions from Kharkov, Dnipropetrovsk. It would be a genuinely challenging arrangement for the Ukrainian government. In my view, however, if we uh, offered the Ukrainian government a combination of a genuine security guarantee, of uh, real security assistance, coupled with a kind of tough love when we would tell them that that is what, th what they need to accept with a clear understanding that they would restore their control over the border, uh, that uh, it would be a unified Ukraine. I think that if we have done that, you can see how you can get, get out of this spiral of uh, escalation and potentially miscalculation. But it's not going to be easy, and as Graham said, it would require real political will. Let me do just two, two more one-liners on it, because uh, yep. I think Dimitri and I agree mostly, but slightly to disagree. First, I would say that the image that Putin has a big idea of what he's doing in Ukraine, I don't believe at all. I think he stumbles from one day to the next. Uh, I think that's how he got into Crimea. And I think that's the picture now. I think he will often portray things as if, well, if we could arrange this this way and that that way, this would be good enough. I think that's like a drawing on a, on a piece of paper without too much control of the reality. That's number one. Number two, I think in terms of the economy, Ukraine will probably fail economically before it fails in security terms. I mean, Ukraine was a basket case for 22 years and it hasn't changed. It's only gotten worse. And there's nobody uh, going to come and provide any substantial amount of funds for Ukraine. Not the US, not the Europeans. So I would say again, as, as Putin looks at it, he's looking at a at a problem, an economic problem as opposed to the other. And then third and finally, I think Putin's understanding of economics is zero. Okay? So I think he has no idea why things go up or why things go down. It's all mysterious to him. It'd be just as well he was doing brain surgery or otherwise. And so I think that in terms of what therefore is happening, he's just sort of getting, you know, one day a piece of information or another day, which is what makes one more worried. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's see if we can open up for some questions real quickly. I think we can start over here. Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. Uh, I share the author's concern uh, that we're in a greater danger of armed conflict than we have been in a great many years. But there hasn't been much discussion that that conflict, if it were to come, would primarily take place in Europe. And Europeans have some views on this. One of the things we have done by expanding NATO is to create a much more fissured and fragmented alliance than we ever had during the Cold War. I don't think it's a big secret that there are a lot of people in Germany today who are more worried about Washington than they are about Moscow. Uh, and there are a lot of people in the major European countries that are willing to make compromises about Ukraine over Ukraine's head that Washington is not. So I'd like to hear a little discussion from the authors about the transatlantic aspect of this issue. I mean, clearly there are differences about what, not just about the nature of sanctions, but what sanctions are intended to do. The Europeans, from my point of view, regard sanctions as engagement with Russia by other means. Whereas in this city, the sanctions are really about isolation, containment, and ultimately regime change in Russia. Those are very, very different things. So. There, there's been references to the alliance, there's been reference to the Europeans, 
But if you're really talking about the danger of armed conflict, you have to talk about where that would take place and the fact that the days when we dominated the alliance during the Cold War reflected a, a coherence of strategic concept, which I think does not exist in the transatlantic relationship today. That's a very provocative question. A very good question, yeah. and a big one, but just to try to be brief, I'd say mostly I agree with the, with the, with the, uh, uh, the statement that's embodied in the, in the question. I think that uh, NATO uh, is certainly the greatest alliance in history and was absolutely crucial in victory in the Cold War, but uh, has largely become an American security blanket and guarantee for Europeans who've become postmodern. And postmodern means war is obsolete and it's not part of their agenda. Uh, and you can see this in their military forces, which basically are not about fighting. And that's actually uh, something that Russians have picked up on, as, as was mentioned in the earlier piece. So uh, uh, you can see in reaction to what happened in, in Ukraine, therefore a kind of a shattering moment for lots of Europeans, thinking, wait a minute, maybe there is still uh, people in the world who use force to advantage or thinking to advantage. And, uh, but uh, there's a debate that goes on back and forth of whether this is enough for us to have to ever re defend ourselves or whether we need to simply hide behind the Americans. And, and then when you hide behind the Americans, but yes, how dependable are they? Maybe they're going to be more aggressive than you want to be. So just Wayne, this is exactly what you said. I think the, the sanctions component, I've been very surprised how effective uh, the alliance has been in holding together the sanctions against Russia, which I would have thought were, would have been undermined otherwise. And I think that's a lot of credit to the Obama administration and to Mrs. Merkel, who worked together quietly with respect to that. Uh, and I think when the sanctions lapse in June, the European sanctions, uh, there's going to be a big, uh, a big, a big event because uh, uh, either they're going to have to reconstitute them, and in the way that the EU makes decisions, I think that's going to be pretty difficult. Or then there'll be some partial. So I think a number of the people in Moscow are looking for that to be the occasion for things to unravel there a bit, and for there to be a division between the Americans and the Europeans. And again, if you were just playing at great power politics from Moscow, splitting the Europeans from the Americans is where you need to go because American politics is going to be anti Russian for as far as you can see. Uh, and therefore, uh, looking for those opportunities, and that's, that, that would be the place, I think, to look. Plus, Putin's working very hard, and the Russians underneath the table or around the table, uh, as, for example, in you know, Hungary. Yeah. Uh, real quickly, before we move to other questions, does Ambassador Kosiak want to add something to that? Yes, uh, I thought that microphone is here, not by coincidence. <laughs> and I wanted to use it to prove that I, I'm a friend of Nixon Center, but do not necessarily agree with what it says. <laughs> I would like your permission for a couple of comments rather than questions, because I've been listening to this discussion and I was taken aback about what we are discussing in the 21st century possibility of war between the U.S. and Russia, how to influence uh, a leader of Russia to submission, not to allow this. I know, I understand, I hope I understand the intent of the authors, and they want to send a warning as to where we can go if uh, some reason isn't applied. But looking at all this debate, looking at what is being discussed uh, instead of things that are important, uh, I'm rather disappointed because the whole issue of a Ukraine is not between U.S. and Russia with due respect of your interest to be able to influence everywhere. It's not about you. It's not about Russia and Ukraine. It's about 
Ukrainian government not been willing or able to talk to their own people. That's the biggest point that is largely missed in overall debates in the United States. As far as we are concerned, what occurred in uh, Ukraine in February last year was a coup. A legitimate government was overthrown and uh, it was overthrown by force and the United States chose to support what happened and to support those who committed these actions. And that's where we do not see eye to eye. And that's the basic thing. All other are derivatives of this issue. So if we are serious, and here is I think one of the most intellectually sophisticated uh, group of people one can imagine, if we are seriously thinking as what to do in order to bring some normalcy to our relation, one need to look to the core of the situation. I will say a couple of words about it. But before that, I would say that even Dmitry, with due respect, who certainly knows us much better than many other American friends, uh, knows our psychology because he, he has grown out of the same. Uh, he, he doesn't fully represent the Russian thinking, the role of the president, and how things are being uh, developed in Russia. A couple of points. Putin certainly is a very strong leader. He enjoys enormously high popularity. 86% is, I think, record high, not only for us. And the decision making that is uh, working in Russia assures that whatever the president does enjoys full support of the people. And here I think to apply the kind of American thinking about how American policy would have worked in Russia in forging decision doesn't apply. We have Security Council and uh, most probably we haven't been present at the Council. I had the chance. And it's very vigorous debate. And to represent it as a kind of rubber stomping uh, mechanism is big, big uh, understatement, if not uh, to suggest else. Secondly, the whole issue of what Russia wants, uh, the character of Russians, that Russia wants to draw attention to it by using the best of its ability, and the best is certainly fighting a war. That is absolutely uh, unthinkable. First of all, Russia is a self-sufficient, quite powerful econ economy. The way it is represented here, uh, like it being in shambles, is that wrong. It's developing slower and more difficult now but, uh, than it used to be. But listen, during the times of the presidency of Putin, the net income of the Russian family increased almost tenfold. The economy is one of the six or seven largest economies in the world. Our microeconomic parameters, if you compare it with Germany, France, Italy, Spain, except for two parameters with Germany, we are doing much better even today in the falling oil prices and the under sanctions. And I would mind you, as sanctions are certainly a very unpleasant thing that doesn't help development, but it's not the prime uh, problem uh, for Russia. Our main economic problem is our own fault. We haven't diversified the economy because mm -hmm. the, uh, the blessing that we have in terms of oil and gas reserves, it's also a curse. We have proven to be so over relying on expert of oil and gas that in the case of the world crisis uh, in the world uh, oil and gas markets, we affected sometimes more than the others. Sanctions is just additional nuance, but they are certainly felt. But it's also opportunity. As a result of sanctions, you will see the Russian industry will be growing because it got impulse, it's got better market inside Russia. If you look at the uh, food market, it's spectacular change that occurred within this year, with Russian uh, stuff appearing uh, and easily competing with the imports. 
And it's something that certainly isn't coming uh, lightly because it brings some inflation as well. But it's going pretty well. Moreover, you also do not understand here because you don't live in Russia that people living in Russia do not care too much about the exchange rate and the prices uh, of education uh, for the kids in uh, abroad because they're very limited number of people who were willing to do so or were able to afford it anyway. And those who spend their weekends in Courcheville in France, they can do it even today because they do not care too much about the exchange rate because they earn much, much more. So look at the figures that Dmitry gave. 86% of support, so 14% are not maybe fully supporting. Out of this 40%, it's only a small por uh, portion of the people who do suffer from the drop of, of the price. What people care about is somewhat different in economics. It's inflation rate. And that is something that the government is focusing now because that is something that will be defining the ability of the government to sustain economic commitments that it has made. And I would say that in some peculiar way, the uh, drop uh, in uh, uh, ruble rate towards dollar brings more rubles in taxes on oil and gas exporting companies. So if you look at the uh, balance of Russian uh, federal budget, it went only 0.25%, less than 1% deficit. So we did rather uh, reliably uh, well, relatively, because we could have and should have done much, much better. We expect that this year there will be a further reduction as a kind of follow-up to last year by a couple percents in uh, real second. <coughs> by the end of this year, we plan to see uh, increase in uh, economic growth, and next year I think would be even more solid. We will su we'll survive. We will survive sanctions. We have adopted already the uh, budget outlays based on new price estimations for oil and gas, and we are going to do it anyway pretty solidly. Rosneft keeps saying that they are profitable even with the price of $30 per barrel. And all the expectations are that the price by the end of this year, it's not ours, it's international, would be significantly higher. It's not going to reach the same ceilings as it had, but uh, it will. But I know that you want the others to post questions, but I'm so willing to contribute. That, uh, <laughs> that's for a couple of minutes more. But when it comes to back to the roots of the problem, and I think that if you are serious, uh, and I appreciate the effort to warn us all about the dangers, but if you are interested in thinking seriously as what needs to be done, I think uh, one has not to start fantasizing as to whether Russia is going to take over Estonia or not. It's, it's mind-boggling even to hear because we are not contemplating any kind of this sort. And had Russia uh, thought about something outrageous like this idea, you, you understand, it uh, was so easy in the past. We never contemplated anything of this sort, and I do not see any reason why it can occur. But what we see happening next to Russia is the stark increase of the presence uh, of NATO forces, uh, making uh, trainings, uh, maneuvers. The number of flights of NATO forces next to our borders has quadrupled, I think. And uh, that is something that is reality, that we need to react to. So whenever we say that we will uh, defend ourselves under all circumstances, we'll see at the changing potential threat next to our borders. When uh, events in uh, Ukraine started, we saw uh, aircraft uh, of NATO countries being deployed in numbers in the uh, Baltics, battleships coming to the uh, Black Sea to patrol next to Russian borders. We are not naive. We understand uh, the signals. And we certainly will re uh, respond to signals because 
we are not going to allow to be coerced militarily. So whatever discussions you see in Russia about the use of potential, uh, use of uh, military potential, it's, it's reassurance that we do not allow ourselves to be coerced. But it doesn't mean that we are planning it to take over the Europe like it was uh, presented here many years ago. So, once again, what is important if we are serious about what is happening? Look at what is happening in Kiev. Look at the people marching in the street in Kiev with SS insignia uh, on their sleeves. Look at the marches uh, with the f uh, fucking, what is the English, uh, fires uh, in the Nazi Germany style. Uh, in uh, Kiev, look at how feel uh, those who do not want "quote unquote" Ukrainization of the east of Ukraine. That President Poroshenko, I think it was in early February, speaking in Kresheti, promised to his people, "We will Ukrainize the eastern uh, Ukraine." Ukrainize, in the con historical context of Ukraine, his particular history. So we need to make sure that you cover the Ukrainian government talk to their own people, that they pr do what they promised, including uh, uh, revisiting the Constitution uh, through uh, all-inclusive dialogue, and it doesn't happen. No dialogue, no implementation <coughs> of the promises of economic help to the region, nothing of the sort has been implemented. That is the problem that we need to can, can I, think. I, 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 we definitely want to have more questions. I want to ask a very quick one if I yes. can. Though, but yeah, it's not I, my... I, well, I know, but since you've, you've raised the issue, I, I spent four years in, in Moscow, Christian and others around here have spent more years living in Moscow than I have. And what struck me about the time that we were there was how Russia, for all of its disagreements with the West or other parts of the world, wanted to be integrated with the world. It wanted to be part of the G8. It wanted to be part of the WTO. It wanted to be part of these international institutions. And now, uh, it, it, now it's going backwards. And I wonder, and, and you're, I understand your point about the, the what you call a coup in Kiev, but the truth is most other countries who have been involved in this don't see it your way. And you are being, you're now, you're now been excluded from the G8. Uh, the sanctions have been applied. Is there a feeling that you are going to be isolating yourselves from the outside world that you spent so many years trying to integrate into? With due respect, the United States and G7 countries is not the whole world. No, of course not. But the dozens of countries that have Secondly, involved themselves the in Ukraine, are changing. they have... And the G7 operating without Russia loses its uh, ability to influence because it's once again a Western closed club. With Russia, it was something more balanced and people were listening to what G8 was telling because Russian presence gave a different look to the uh, statements that we have made as a G8. If G7 wants to leave as G7, fine, go speak. We will continue living the way we have. The problem is that current problems in the world are better handled in G20 currently than in G8. And even while G8 was still in uh, uh, operation, everybody was looking to the economic solution to G20 because there are so many important economic players appearing on the stage that without talking to them, you wouldn't be able to resolve a single strategically important economic issue. Then you say that we uh, wanted to integrate in the world. We are not coming from the moon. We have been living on this planet for quite a while, <laughs> longer than the United States. And we have a lot of friends outside of the United States and Europe. We certainly are European culture. We are European uh, in our history. We love Europe and we, even in our Russian uh, parlance, we do not use the term European as applied to EU because we are Europe. And if you look at the map, half of the Europe is Russia, the rest is the EU, geographically. But we also, Asian, we are Eurasia, and we have advantages because we have so many friends and so many neighbors in Asia. 
And mind you, one of the biggest decisions that we have taken uh, previously was to diversify Russian economy. Diversify meant that we need to go from over reliance on oil and gas and move towards uh, more innovative technology. We have wealth of science technology. Our problem is uh, low ability to put it uh, to the service of the market economy. That is our problem, and we will overcome it. But we certainly uh, now are thinking about second diversification. And not only thinking, we are doing it. And second diversification means not over rely on the ties with the West. Because we learned that on the backdrop of the uh, theories that were offered to us by convincing us to do, join WTO, which we gladly did, and the old debates about Russia going uh, to, mar to market economy, that the freedom of trade, movement of capital is something that will make us all richer and more prosperous. What happened? The moment you see a political disagreement, all of these principles have become hostage of political decisions. What is sanctions? It comes even to the degree that was unthinkable uh, in my view of American uh, psychology and American policies. You seize, without any court decisions, private property. Like sanctions against uh, individuals in Russia, the first round of sanctions, you remember, there were people like, for example, Minister of Culture. His assets in the United States, I'm not sure he does have them. But if he does have it, uh, arrested. For what? Mr. Rodenberg's villa in Italy. <laughs> I don't know who has what. What I'm suggesting is, that without any uh, uh, decisions by a court, without the person committing any crime, you punish him for what? For him being considered to be a friend of the leadership of the country. It's mind-boggling. It certainly defies the notion of free trade, free flow of trade. And uh, that means in turn, and you see it's happening, and most probably it's going to increase, that it's not only us who look at this situation. It's not only us who believe that you cannot over-rely uh, on long-term partnerships with the West. And you will see more and more increase of partnerships and cooperation outside of this framework. You will see um, significantly more willingness of the other countries to trade in a way that would be less dependent on dollar system because it is uh, vulnerable to political decisions, uh, one-sided uh, political decisions. You see already happening. Uh, BRICS have established a bank with $100 billion worth of initial capital. Our Chinese friends are launching any uh, bank that is go not going to be dependent on uh, the dollar uh, system. And by the way, a number of Europeans rush to join in. We also are going to be co sponsor of this idea. Look at the new deals uh, uh, concluded in Asia, not by Russia, but Russia also, among others. We all prefer now to think how we are going to trade bypassing the dollar system. And it's certainly something that I hope to be able to say in 10 years, sit in this room with these people and to discuss how the world has changed. It will. Let's try to Thank bring you. in some questions here. I'm sorry. I'm behind you. Uh, Dick Solomon ran. I want to try to go back to uh, Graham's initial point about the dangers of a strategic stumble or a strategic surprise into a conflict. And I think we need to look at the situation in a broader context. You have three critical regions of the world led by strong leaders, each of whom is not satisfied with the status quo, that wants to break out of the Cold War constraints. And uh, in my view, you can paint a scenario, whether it's the Ayatollah in his region, Xi Jinping in Asia, or what we see happening in Europe with a somewhat different perspective than we've heard in this great detail, in which somebody's going to make a mistake. And we know all that, uh, that familiar say, uh, statement from Machiavelli, it's 
nice to be respected. It's better to be feared. We're backfooted now, and we have neither, I would say, respect or fear as an element in our approach to dealing with the world. And my concern is that in one region or another, may not be in Europe, one of these uh, leaders who really wants to see a, a change in the status quo is going to overstep, feeling they have room for maneuver, and we're going to get pulled into a very nasty situation, one reason or another. And then how these regions interact, that's another lunch discussion. <laughs> Graham, do you want to say anything about that? You want to take some other questions? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, that's, uh, how about over here? Um, I'd just like to say one, one word. I think the article is by far and away the best thing that has been written in quite a while about the, the relationship. I don't agree with every point, but the attempt to understand the situation as seen from Moscow is, I think, a real uh, contribution. And if you look at it that way, then a lot of what Putin does, in fact, is logical. Does he want us to arm the uh, Ukrainians? I'm sure a part of the, the, the inner circle does, particularly the military part, because as you say, that would therefore justify him taking other actions. But you, when you get up to the beginning, you mentioned going back to the Cold War. I don't think, I think we would be envious of being able to do that. In those days, you had a very aging, conservative leadership in, in Russia and the Soviet Union that really was interested to a large extent in stability and strategic stability and didn't want to change the status quo. In Putin, you have just the opposite. You have a risk taker uh, who has taken a couple of risks, and he has seen, lo and behold, that it works. He's seen the future and it works. Could any of you imagine uh, a year ago that Putin would be able to annex uh, Crimea without a shot? Uh, all in, and then have it uh, legally or semi-legally justified and everything. In two or three weeks, this is, it's just in, incomprehensible. In the same way that the, the article then uh, posits the stumbling into uh, conflict because I can easily imagine, and the, the ambassadors gave an example, uh, and that was that uh, the Russians had noticed all these maneuvers by the United States and bringing exercises and so forth. Well, if you were asked the uh, Americans about that, or the, uh, the government officials, they'd say, this was in reaction to something that Russia was doing. So both sides see themselves as justified and they're doing something defensively against the other. And this danger of the old spiral of interaction here is something that could get out of control. And then if you look what Russia has done le recently, raising the nuclear issue, your namesake, Mr. Ambassador, has said that the United States should think twice because uh, Russia can reduce the United States to radioactive dust. I don't think that really is too helpful. Uh, they, and Russia has, in the last month or so, uh, announced that it will put uh, Iskander missiles uh, in Kaliningrad. It is said that they will put the backfire, which is a nuclear-capable uh, aircraft, in Crimea. And this then takes it to another level when we start getting the nuclear issue involved. So I would just say, and, and I now ask my question, if we were to do some of the things that uh, you and Dimitri uh, say, Graham, isn't there a danger in some way that we would be uh, showing that brinkmanship pays that Putin has taken a number of steps 
Crimea being won or his actions after the shooting shoot down of the uh, Malaysian airliner, uh, where he essentially doubled down and raised the ante, and we backed down. Isn't there a danger that this would be seen as uh, that brinkmanship pays? That's what he, he's played a weak hand brilliantly in some ways, and very skillfully. I think we're about to, we're running out of time, so let's have some quick, if you want to answer that and close, uh, just, close your thoughts. Just quickly, uh, I think it's a very good question. I think we remember, I mean, one of the few ideas in security studies is a security dilemma. And so Dimitri actually found a great uh, quote from Thucydides, who had got a version of this, where basically I'm only trying to make sure you don't get confused about Estonia and Latvia by making sure I circulate a tripwire through there. And as the ambassador said, you're looking at it from a Russian perspective and saying, this looks threatening to us. Now, uh, I think that uh, it's a little far-fetched for me to imagine the Estonians or the Latvians trying to liberate part of Russia, but still I can imagine if I'm the, in the general staff, I've got a plan against worst case scenarios. So what I do that's defensive can look offensive to you and vice versa. And that's a well-known path by which one thing leads to the other and something else bad happens. Secondly, on your point about brinksmanship works, I mean, that's what we learned in the Cold War too, that brinksmanship can work and that in, to the extent that it does, it can then embolden. So that's a great danger. And I think that Crimea has happened, so that's been integrated already into people's calculus, saying, wait a minute, you know, that seemed a little dangerous and worked out okay. And I think that it did. So I don't think we can reverse that. Whether if we were to provide an exit ramp, and Putin were interested in an exit ramp now, uh, that kind of got you to a, a version of a frozen conflict in Ukraine as a lousy outcome, but better than the alternatives, that would then embolden some further actions. I think it's, it's worth to worry about. But I think relative to the alternative, it still looks better to me. <clears throat> Uh, Steve, I think that you <coughs> have answered your question about brinksmanship. It is all in the eye of the beholder. What one side uh, perceives as brinksmanship is viewed by another side uh, is a minimally appropriate response. Look, unless we take a position uh, that nothing short of a complete victory, humiliating Putin in the process is acceptable, uh, nothing that Graham and I suggest uh, would imply any kind of a surrender to Putin or to Russia in general. First, we are talking about Ukraine, which with an exception of uh, Crimea, would have territorial integrity, sovereignty, peace and control of its border. We are talking about uh, this Ukraine uh, being fully entitled to enter in whatever arrangements they would want to enter with uh, the European Union. Nothing in our article suggests otherwise. In terms of uh, NATO, uh, Graham and I make very clear uh, that we do believe that uh, American credibility is at stake not only in Europe, uh, but globally, uh, and uh, that we absolutely have to uh, support our allies, not necessarily encouraging them to be needlessly provocative, but making clear that the security is protected. I incidentally, before we wrote this article, when this conflict only started, uh, both on PBS and in Peter's newspaper, no pet, <coughs> said that our first response should be to work with our allies to make sure that we have contingency, credible contingency plans uh, for Baltic states, something I was arguing for years, and I did feel that we should be uh, uh, prepared to make very clear to the Russian government, preferably quietly, uh, that any uh, Russian intervention in Ukraine uh, would mean that the administration would find uh, itself in, in the Baltics, in Ukraine, uh, would find itself under irresistible uh, pressure <coughs> to provide weapons and training to the Ukrainian government. Uh, I think that this is not uh, a position of a preemptive surrender. What I do think, however, uh, that <coughs> the reality is, as they like to say in Congress, 
that Russia not only has a huge stake in Ukraine, but Russia has an escalation dominance in this region. Uh, if we want to get all of it, <coughs> we have to be prepared to fight. And we also have to be prepared, if, even if we don't need to fight, that this would become a frozen uh, conflict with uh, a huge potential of exploding at any moment because of events in another area. Uh, this is like the Balkans. And we don't want Ukraine to become the Balkans. And mind you, uh, if you are concerned about the Ukrainian people, it would not be good either. That is why what Graham and I think are suggesting is not a surrender, is not accommodation of Putin, but a compromise which would accomplish our fundamental objectives while giving the Russian government a credible way out. No more, no less. Uh, well, listen, I think we're going to have to wrap it up here, I'm afraid, but uh, Jacob's going to probably say a couple closing words. No? Okay. Well, uh, then, on behalf of everybody here, thank you very much for coming, and thank you for a great, vigorous discussion today. Appreciate it.